hello friends today we'll talk about cinema novo which is largely uh, the kind of movement or the kind of developments which happened in the brazilian cinema and when we tend to understand the situation which developed in the brazil in that context that how cinema all over the world at that point of time was coming up with new kinds of ideas whether the italian neo realism or nouvelle vague in france so all these kinds of developments also affected the cinema across the world and some of the filmmakers they got affected by these kinds of developments and started uh, with their own new kinds of ideas which could be reflected in the cinema novo in the context of the brazilian cinema in the context of the world cinema as well in those times we also see that there was a new pattern which was emerging largely because of especially in the uh, context of italy as well as germany in the context of the fascist cinema where neo realism emerged or in the context of other political developments in other regions we, which were talking about that a new kind of cinema which was based on the reality uh, was to be exhibited to the masses so we find uh, that their concerns largely were different across uh, the different countries and they they in a way wanted to project a kind of reality uh, which was not show, not shown earlier in the context of readings one can refer to randall johnson brazilian cinema novo and then carlos diaz and then yakir mind of cinema novo film comment september october 1980 then when we talk and and some of the uh, readings from which are available at wikipedia as well they they can also be referred and you can also see some of the filmmakers and critics uh, on the screen as well those who were very very important in the context of uh, the brazilian cinema whether global roca or santos or carlos all these people those who were associated with the brazilian cinema of those times and uh, we have also seen that how cinema novo in a way altered the brazilian cinematic and the cultural scene as well when it first appeared and uh, the populist government of the early 1960s was quite unceremoniously removed by 1964 military coup and replaced by a military regime and with them the brazil's military rulers they brought a reign of repression and torture uh, which intensified in 1969 and began to end or uh, in a way decline ab only in mid 1970s so how the political developments of uh, these particular period how they were important in the framework of cinema as well and when we talk about cinema novo in the context of the political developments uh, of those times uh, we realize that these political developments definitely had some kind of an impact on uh, the developments in cinema as well and then we also see that uh, when you talk about that particular period the, which was a period of growth which was uh, also known as uh, was the economic miracle in that sense uh, when uh, after the repression uh, we find that this uh, time arrived and which in a way also was talking about the redistribution of the already poorly distributed wealth from the working class to the upper classes so the situation in a way uh, deteriorated for the working classes in that sense and we also find that after the miracle uh, the situation of nightmare also arrived when 100 billion dollar foreign debt could be seen and the servicing of which consumes virtually all of country's export earnings and which also threatens to tear as and uh, the country's Uh, social situation in that sense so we find when you talk about the kind of situation which, which was existing at that period of time then when then we see global roca he summarized the concerns of the uh, initial period of cinema novo in, in manifesto an aesthetic of hunger which was also known as an aesthetic of violence and where he was talking about uh, the kind of hunger which existed in latin america and uh, it was also some kind of an essence of uh, the society as well and in his own words when we try to see it uh, the kind of the tragic originality of the cinema novo in relation to the world cinema so when you talk about our originality 
uh, is our hunger. This is what he writes and our greatest misery is that this hunger is felt but not intellectually understood. So, only a culture of hunger can qualitatively surpass its own structures by undermining and destroying them. So, this is how Roka was writing in this uh, particular context and when he was talking about the kind of uh, society which Latin America was and the kind of situation of hunger and poverty uh, which existed in that kind of a society. And uh, we talk, when we talk about Cinema Novo in that particular context, uh, in the context of the world cinema as well, then we uh, realize that Cinema Novo was talking in the uh, framework of its originality and that originality was in the context of the hunger, poverty, starvation, deprivation, all these things which were uh, there at that point of time. And uh, he also in a way talks about that how uh, despite that hunger was in a way being felt, but it was not uh, intellectually understood as well. And uh, he also talks that how uh, when you talk about the cultural manifestation of hunger, then it is in the framework of the violence. And Cinema Novo in that sense reveals that uh, violence is normal behavior for starving and the violence of a starving man is not a sign of a primitive mentality as well. So, in that sense, Cinema Novo teaches us that the aesthetics of violence are revolutionary rather than primitive in nature and the movement of violence is a movement when colonizer becomes aware of the existence of the colonized. So, uh, in that sense, this kind of a dichotomy between the colonizer and the colonized is generally being talked in the context uh, of Cinema Novo. And uh, it is also being communicated that when one is confronted with violence, one can uh, in a way can colonize and understand uh, through the horror, the strength of the culture which he was exploiting. And as long as he does not take up arms, the colonized man, uh, he remains a slave. So, we find that the manifesto which Roka was talking about, it was trying to align uh, in a clear manner with the Fanon and the struggle for the third world liberation. And uh, one uh, Roka is not in a way talking about the real violence in a revolutionary situation, but rather of an aesthetic of violence, some kind of a metaphorical usage of violence in a situation. Uh, he was writing after the military coup of 1964. So, it was far from revolutionary in that sense. So, when we tend to understand such kind of a manifesto uh, within the framework of the changes which were happening in the Brazilian society and when we try to see this aesthetic of violence, so this kind of a violence uh, was some sort of a, also a metaphorical usage of violence in that kind of a situation. So, uh, we in a way talk about an alternative form of cinematic practice which Roka and the Cinema Novo also talk about and which would in a way combat the idealistic illusionism of the dominant cinema and uh, at the same time participate in the struggle for the national liberation as well. So, when we tend to understand Cinema Novo as a movement then we in a way understand that it cannot be isolated from its historical context. Historical context is very, very important in the context of Cinema Novo. And in many ways, it responds to and is influenced by the political developments of the uh, Brazilian society. So, it in a way positions itself in relation to the historical evolution of the Brazilian cinema and it participates in and reflects ideological debates of period in which it arose. So, uh, from that point of view, uh, we when we tend to understand Cinema Novo within the historical context of its time, then uh, we realize that how the political developments of uh, the Brazilian society were influencing it. And uh, we also see that it also positions itself in relation to the historical evolution of the Brazil Brazilian cinema as well. And uh, the ideological debates of that particular period, they were also very, very important the way in, uh, uh, Cinema Novo emerged in those times. And uh, some of the scholars, the people, those who were trying to understand Cinema Novo within a particular framework and how they have seen uh, Cinema Novo over the years, they, they have argued that Cinema Novo had ceased to exist by 1972. 
if not earlier and, uh, and when we tend to understand the movements only collective manifesto uh, which were known as Lose Agdo Manifesto which was published only in 1973. So, the scholars those who are in a way arguing that how the movement ceased to exist by only till 1972 uh, by that time it had in a way uh, declined in some manner. And uh, the others, those who reject this kind of an argument and they see uh, the shades of Cinema Novo quite later and uh, they also realize that even uh, the contemporary Brazilian cinema was influenced uh, by the kind of developments which were happening uh, in the Cinema Novo as well. So, when uh, we talk about the various kinds of situations which arise during this uh, particular period, uh, we find that some of the filmmakers, uh, those who were closely associated with Cinema Novo, uh, how the, over a period of time uh, they were making films and their films were uh, though not very popular from the box office point of view, but they had a lot of relevance from uh, the point of view of the history as well as the developments in the Brazilian cinema. And uh, we also have seen that how uh, Brazilian cinema also considerably developed over a period of time and how around 100 films per year they were also being uh, produced in, in, in Brazilian cinema. So, uh, when we tend to compare the earlier productions then we find that in 1960s uh, the number of productions were comparatively less uh, which uh, increased over a period of time uh, to more than 100 uh, during this particular period. Then we also see that some of the directors, those who were associated with uh, the Brazilian cinema, whether Husman or L Nelson Pereira dos Santos, and then Carlos, then Jacquim Pedro, and Arnaldo Zabor. Uh, they clearly dominate the Brazilian cinema in the later times as well. And uh, they not only dominate uh, with their films, but they also dominate the state cinematic apparatus which is Embra film. So, in this way uh, we find that uh, even when uh, these directors, uh, they, they were making the later films as well. So, they were in a way also affected uh, with the developments which had taken place in the Brazilian society. And these filmmakers. Uh, they not only dominate uh, in the context of the way they were making these films, but they were also dominating from uh, the point of view of the state uh, cinematic apparatus as well, which was known as the Embra film. And uh, we find that when, when these uh, filmmakers with their kinds of ideas, when they uh, made cinema, then it was clearly very uh, not uh, what successful from the point of view of the commercial aspect, uh, but it was in a way recognized at international level as well. And uh, when Liz Husband award winning 1981 film, uh, They Don't Wear Black Tie was, uh, was upon its release, uh, referred to as Cinema Novo, uh, the Novo Cinema Novo Anew. So, such uh, kinds of films uh, which came during this time and by the important filmmakers, then uh, these filmmakers they were trying to redefine uh, uh, the cinema novo as a movement that it was a new kind of a cinema uh, in those times. Then uh, we also see that some of the filmmakers they, they have in a way recently claimed that not without a bit of self serving. Uh, in a way exaggeration that he and other leaders of Brazilian cinema as Carlos uh, Dias does uh, that the, the other leaders uh, he including the other leaders of the Brazilian cinema. They are new barbarians of the international cinema since they are free from the gadgetry and the large budgets of the Hollywood and from high culture and correct ideological lines of uh, European cinema. So, in that way uh, we find that uh, how uh, the international uh, cinema or uh, how in a way was trying to see the Brazilian cinema and how these filmmakers those who were associated with uh, Cinema Novo how they were seeing themselves as well. And uh, they in a way uh, 
um, in a way try to understand themselves and also the historical developments of that particular period that how these people they were in a way free from the gadgetry and the large budgets of the Hollywood uh, because they were making uh, different kinds of uh, cinema and also from the high culture and the correct ideological lines of the European cinema uh, because the, their cinema was different from uh, the cinema which was happening in Europe. So, in that way when we try to understand the directors, those who were associated with Cinema Novo, how they discussed the film projects as they did in the early 60s as well. And one of them, husband, he has responded in that sense that uh, in a way we had never stopped discussing our films and there have been some personal rifts between the different filmmakers but discussing uh, the discussion goes on. Uh, but then collaboration at the beginning was never quite as intense as people, people thought about it and it is like Beatles this is what he says that they never were really as united before as people thought nor really as separated uh, afterwards. So, we find that the people those who were associated with Cinema Novo and uh, how these people uh, they tend to understand their own cinema in that context and uh, how the filmmakers they were also uh, trying to collaborate with each other, how they were also discussing uh, the kind of ideas which they had even in the later times and such kind of uh, discussions they continued uh, even, e even after when the film was complete. So, we they were not discussing only in the period called 1960s, but thereafter as well and uh, one can refer to Cinema Novo existing later if seen as an open ended process of cinematic activity, but not uh, clearly as a narrowly defined tightly knit movement or school. So, in that context when one can uh, one can one refers to cinema novo uh, in that sense. So, it was some sort of an open ended process of cinematic activity because uh, uh, the movement or the ideals which were associated with the uh, movement or school in, in it in that sense they also continue for a, a later period of time as well and uh, they were not narrowly defined uh, in that sense that they could be narrowly defined as well. So, such, uh, uh, such kind of developments they were very very important from uh, the point of view of uh, the understanding of the people those who were uh, associated uh, with Cinema Novo. And uh, when, when one talks about the 1950s and the early 1960s that how the movement developed during this time and it was seen as to be part of a broad heterogeneous movement of cultural uh, transformation that involved theater, popular music and literature as well as cinema. And the seeds of cinema no novo took root in early 1950s as has been talked about earlier as well. And thereafter, we find that the movement emerged or arose in the late 1950s and early 60s. And uh, when you talk about early 1950s, especially in the uh, three film industry congresses which were held in the Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo in 1952 and 1953. So, we find that how the film congresses they also helped. Uh, the movement to take some kind of a route in that sense and when such kind of discussions they were being held in these uh, congresses where, when they had they were when they took place in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo then also they provided some kind of a thrust uh, in that sense uh, to the movement or to the ideals which were associated with Cinema Novo. We also see that many of the filmmakers, how these uh, filmmakers when they articulated their ideas in these uh, congresses and when they were talking about the creation of an independent national cinema. So, this uh, kind of uh, the, these kinds of views provided some kind of a thrust to the developments whether it was Nelson Pereira dos Santos, Alex Vaini, Rodolfo Nani, all of them uh, they were talking about in these congresses about the kind of changes which were very imperative and important uh, from the point of view of the development. And uh, within the kind of a historical context when one tries to see these developments one finds uh, 
that the middle class artists and the intellectuals such as those who uh, created the cinema novo they became increasingly uh, politicized and sought to commit their art to the transformation of the Brazilian society. So, how the historical context was important and the people those who were associated with Cinema Novo, uh, they were committed to such kind of a cause and uh, it in a way sought to commit their act to the transformation of the Brazilian society as well. So, when we tend to understand uh, Cinema Novo in that particular context, we find that the first phase of uh, the Cinema Novo goes from 1960 to 64 and a period in which the national questions they were being debated at every level of the society. And the films of this particular period they in a way tried to contribute to debate uh, with films about the country's lumpen often depicted in, uh, depicted in the rural settings. So, we find that how uh, this particular phase uh, which was the first phase of the cinema novo, it in a way was talking about a period in which such kind of national questions they were being debated uh, at the level of society. And uh, or at the same time we also see that how the films which were being made during this particular period, they also in a way contributed in terms of the debate which were there and how the Brazilian society was uh, being shown uh, during this time. And when you talk about the portrayal or the representation of the Brazilian society, we find that how the country's limpen uh, image in that sense which was depicted in the uh, rural settings that was uh, the concern of uh, the filmmakers of this particular phase. And we also realize when you talk about when the movement or uh, uh, the kind of cinema, cinema, cinema novo was, uh, we find that from 1964 to 68 is considered to be the next phase and it was the year of the fifth institutional act which inaugurated um, a period of extremely re repressive the military rule. And uh, the way the political liberties they were being restricted and censorship was increased during this time. Uh, that was the period of from 64 to 68, there was still a degree of space uh, which was available for the discussion and debate during this time. So, we find that in the second phase uh, uh, during this particular period, the some kind of an open endedness with regard to the discussion and debate, it was open and during this time we find that censorship increased and the political restrictions which were there, uh, they were in a way increased during this uh, uh, particular period. And uh, during this particular period, we also find that the focus of the cinema novo is shifted from the rural uh, to the urban Brazil and as filmmakers, they turned their cameras so as to speak on themselves in an attempt to understand the failure of the left in 1964. So, we also find that how uh, the focus of cinema novo also shifted uh, during this particular period. And earlier it was talking about the rural areas, but now it was turning ish. Uh, turning to the urban Brazil or the urban centers and uh, we also see that how they were trying to understand cinema in, in their own way in a different manner. And uh, thereafter we also see that the movement also goes to the third phase from 1968 uh, till around 1972 and this uh, period of extremely harsh military rule and it was difficult for the filmmakers to express the opinions directly and allegory became the preferred mode of cinematic discourse of what is known as uh, tropicalism in Brazilian cinema. So, we will continue further in our next lecture uh, on Cinema Novo, where we will talk about the further developments uh, which took place in Cinema Novo or the Brazilian cinema and how uh, the makers they tried to adapt to the kind of situation uh, which was there all this uh, will be discussed as well and we will continue further. Uh, thank you very much.